The uh, second item I have is a COVID-19 update, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Worsley, who's been one of our point people for it, and uh, he is also here with Superintendent Dr. Doherty to give some perspective from the school side of the operation. Dr. Worsley. Good morning. Excuse me, I'll say good morning. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Dr. Casey, I'm trying to back you up a few hours. I was moved by the powerful presentation that we just experienced with the freedom flag. Thank you so much, Ms. Tara, for coming forward for that today. This evening, as Dr. Casey said, I want to um, talk a little bit about the COVID update as we stand today. And also, as Dr. Casey said, in Along with me, uh, we have members from the school. Dr. Daughter is in the back along with Dr. Taylor. And joining me at the podium at the end of my portion, uh, presenting on the school's behalf will be Mr. Sean Smith. So a few things I'm gonna go over here, some of the things that I consider on the peripheral, things that we wanna make sure that our citizens have not, um, that they know that we have not forgotten. We, so we wanna make sure we bring this back to their attention. Many think that, yes, we have reached our goal, um, our vaccination community go. We're currently setting at 101.46 as of, um, ironically, 9-11. Um, but at the same time, too, it's not time to celebrate just yet. We still have the, vi the variant that is running rapid in our community still, and very much we want to make sure that we continue to get folks vaccinated. Um, and so much work continues uh, along with Dr. Samuel and his team um, and others in the community as well. So again, much work still needs to be done. In addition to that, I want to bring to the attention that we also have um, a, a chart here that represents new COVID-19 cases and positive uh, test, case, test results. The top graph, um, if you will take a look at here, you see we had a very peak season um, in the January time period, moving into the July 4th time period up to present day. You see that we're still back in the upward swing of things when it comes to new COVID-19 cases. Um, the bottom graph, you will see that the percentages of the PCR tests that people take and those that have tested positive, at least for the last seven days, we are still in what you would call um, above the moderate substantial. We have seen the downturn from high transmission down to the, to the substantial level at this point. And we're still working with um, staff, our statisticians, as well as our medical professionals to kind of see what the discrepancy might be between the two graphs. But at this time, we did want to point those out since we did have that information readily available to share tonight. A little bit of information about our booster shots, COVID-19 booster shots. I know that you probably saw this last Friday on the 17th when um, the FDA Advisory Committee reported uh, that COVID-19, the third shot, is gonna be now available for um, citizens uh, 65 and over, and along with those with underlying health conditions as well. Um, currently, um, vaccinations are not available for individuals, our children, our youth that are ages five to 11. And so hopefully in the future, we will get to that point, and when we are there, we are certainly be able to bring that back to your attention um, as you will see it roll out in the media as well. So, I'm glad you asked a couple of questions. I heard you say, where can I get vaccinated and where can I get a COVID-19 test? So I have the answer for you. If you take a look right here on, on the screen, COVID-19 vaccines um, can be found here at uh, vaccine.gov and also COVID-19 testing sites um, can be also made available uh, at vdh.virginia.gov. You can find it there as well. But I do want to um, bring attention, um, if Dr. Samuel was here tonight, he will certainly want me to mention the Rockwood Vaccination Center, um, headed by Dr. Samuel, um, the VDH um, Chesterfield Health District, COVID vaccine schedule um, for your vaccines um, for Pfizer, Moderna, as well as the J&J. &J. Um, you can go to what, you can, what we call the Rockwood Vaccination Center, it is the old uh, big lot store you may be familiar with near Courthouse Road and Hold Street. So they have a schedule. Um, you can certainly go to uh, uh, Chesterfield Health Dish's website, but if you're listening, just wanna jot this down if you're in the public that is listening tonight. Uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, 3 p.m. to 7 p.m., you can go and receive a COVID vac vaccine. Also on Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Now, if you're in the market for getting a COVID testing, their schedule on those days at the same location um, for the month of September, Tuesdays, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., Wednesdays, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., and Fridays, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So 
This, this, of course, is being recorded, so if you didn't catch that, you can catch it on the recording, and we'll also have it up, uploaded on our website um, and the various websites that I just went over for further clarity um, on what those time slots are. A little information, I told you we're talking about a lot of peripheral things. Um, it's kind of like a, um, what's all in, in the bucket to make this soup for a COVID-19 presentation this evening. So um, you're very familiar also about the COVID-19 protocols and workplace procedures that we have um, here in Chesterfield County. And so this is more of a, of a reminder, and perhaps for those that are listening, giving them an, an update of where we are. Um, so we're still monitoring how COVID-19 affects our workplace, of course. Um, and thanks uh, to uh, David Johnson, our risk manager, director. He's also in the audience tonight. So if there's something in particular that you want to know more about, David is, is certainly on hand to help me with that. Um, but we did bring back the mass um, mandate we do have in the county um, as a result from um, the State Department of Labor and Industry. We were back on September the 8th. Um, we brought back those requirements. We were already doing that earlier in the year. So this was a re-implementation of what we were doing previously to keep folks safe in our work environment current protections um, in our county workplace. All employees are once again required to wear the face mask, um, as I've mentioned, which covers the nose and mouth, um, indoors county workplace, okay? All individuals are expected to maintain the six feet physical distance, um, which we have also uh, petitions, as you see beside me and in our work environment as well. Um, follow good hygiene, cover your, cover your uh, mouth when you cough or sneeze, those type of etiquettes. Um, stay home if you're sick, um, and also avoid crowds and, and, and congregating in large groups, much of what you already are very familiar with, so we won't spend much more time there. I did want to bring um, more information also uh, about the hospital bed capacity and diversion status because that definitely correlates to um, COVID-19, and I'll tell you why in just a second. And certainly, um, in Chief Center's absence, I definitely want to highlight that if he was here tonight, he would also share that. So um, thank the Chief and also Chief Adams for helping with this information as we bring it forward tonight. <clears throat> uh, there are still limited hospital beds available um, in our region when we, when we talk and pull information from um, HCA as well as Bon Secures. We, Ask why, why is that the case? Um, they're still having staffing shortages, higher acuity uh, among the patients, uh, longer inpatient stays, uptick in COVID cases as well. And hospitals are having to avoid patients in the emergency department, which limit the, of course, the emergency department bed capacity. So interesting, as a result of those things, in the region, uh, for the last 37 days straight, we have been in what we call um, black diversion status, which is the highest status. That means that at least eight hospitals in our region um, are currently uh, unable to meet this, this bed capacity. So next step, the step below that is red, and that means five hospitals at least in the region are at that status. So currently we're sitting at the, the highest status. Found most interesting, uh, just actually earlier today, I received more information from C, uh, HCA um, hospitals and it was very interesting. Uh, one of the things they, they also noted to me, um, this large COVID burden, uh, they, they picked up again on that, co that COVID uptick. Um, they also, also focus um, that because of the burden with the peak cases projected in the coming days and weeks, uh, these patients are a resource, excuse me, these patients are resource intensive and have long lengths of stay due to the severity of their illnesses. Uh, one of the things that I picked up on the comments they made is that people uh, may have COVID and some of their cases are getting even more severe is because they are waiting a longer time to come to get treatment or get tested, um, which was one of the things that they noted to me today as well. And then, of course, they go on to, say, to talk about the high acuity of non-COVID patients, um, some, of the, uh, some of these as a result of delayed care and, and or screening as well, and, of course, the disrupt uh, disrupted labor market uh, that they noted as well as being a problematic to have staff in, in the healthcare field readily available. So those are some of the reasons why we're in the black diversion status. Uh, moving right along, I also want to provide you information on, on the COVID-19 pandemic um, employment update because, again, this is directly related to uh, COVID-19 and what does that mean? Well, um, I'm, again, I'm glad you asked. September the 4th was a, was, a, was a major day for many people that were receiving federal um, um, benefits. That was the date that benefits ended for many of our citizens in Chesterfield County. Um, here you will see in the red 
Um, and I, on the left-hand side, it's a nice ledger to tell you what these uh, alphabet soup acronyms mean. And so in the red, the first in the red left column, we have the pandemic emergency unemployment um, compensation. Here you're giving a week ending of 828 with a comparison of week ending 94. So you'll be able to kind of take a look at where we're standing. As of today, um, we have 60, over 6,900 folks um, that are, that are their benefits ended on um, the 4th of September. So the star for the very last uh, FPUC, those numbers are star because those numbers are reflected in the upper three um, um, alphabet soup letters that are there as well. So that gives you a little bit of information in terms of where we are uh, in terms of our folks that are unemployed and those that lost their particular benefits. Again, here on the left uh, gives you what those acronyms mean. But what is more important, I think, is the next slide. Yes, you see the 69 folks here, which are citizens that certainly we are uh, very much want to help if we can. And the next slide shows you exactly how we're going about to, to do that. And thanks to our uh, Social Services Director Kiva Rogers, who's also joining me tonight in the audience for additional questions should you have them. And we all have, and I also like to give credit and thanks to um, Brian Davis with Virginia Career, Career Works for helping with this information, as well as our budget department as well that supplied the information. Well, regarding uh, Virginia uh, Employment <coughs> Commission claimant outreach efforts, Social Services, we have one person that is on site. Um, at this particular location, and she works two days a week to make sure that she's able to provide information regarding resources, job opportunities, job readiness of services uh, to individuals that might be waiting at the Turner Road location where this person is housed while they're waiting to perhaps see somebody at the VEC as well, at asking additional questions and meeting with those people to help them with their, with their problems. And so we've also received very positive feedback about this individual um, who works there and their ability to be able to provide that, that, those resources. In addition to that, uh, data sharing agreement negotiation with Virginia uh, Employment Commission is very important. Um, we know that Virginia Career Works has a agreement. We know that our, our county budget office also has an agreement. So we're, we've been piggybacking to get some of this information from um, those two groups. And Kiva Rogers and myself are actually working to get our own agreement so that we will be able to get firsthand data from um, um, VEC as well so that we can better help our, our folks here in Chesterfield County. Also, as I mentioned um, earlier, Virginia Career Works is a great partner and they're working very well with us, so we appreciate them sharing the data in, in their current agreement. And so do know that efforts are being made to make sure that we can reach out to these individuals because currently we don't have access to be able to reach out to the, the individuals directly to tell them about our services. But I will say in the interim, uh, Virginia Career Works um, and our social services um, director and staff has done a great job to go around the fence, if you will, to, to get to the people, to get information in the hands of others to be able to supply the information. So again, more to come in the near future. So with that being said, with any of the, the peripheral topics that I've talked about so far, are there any questions before we pivot to schools? <clears throat> See, we, we certainly have a lot of information relating to um, uh, vaccinations, and, and, and I certainly appreciate all of what you've put out. I've had some citizens reach out from the community, quite frankly, asking, um, does the CDC or has the CDC or even the state health department put out any information to the community about what they can actually do uh, from a health point of view to perhaps stay healthier to avoid. For example, some of the things I've heard of is an increase in vitamin D, vitamin C. Have we seen anything from the CDC or the state uh, perhaps that we could share with the community? Good question, Mr. Carroll. I, I don't know the answer to that. I have not personally read that yet. Um, I will follow back up with um, um, Dr. Samuel and see if he can provide more information from um, um, VDH as well as other information from CDC and get that information back out to you all. Great, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, with that said, we will pivot over to our friends at school. At schools, we do, as I said, and we have Dr. Daughtery, Dr. Taylor here, but presenting on their behalf tonight uh, will be Mr. Sh uh, Sean Smith, who is coming at the podium. One of the things that I shared with um, the school district before, the com their, before coming tonight, and we put together a couple of things that I thought you may be interested in based on previous conversations that we've had directly or I heard from our citizenry. And so some of those things are pos positive COVID-19 cases among students and staff, 
um, things you may be interested in, COVID-19 safety protocols and procedures um, that are in place regarding classrooms and buses, and other related COVID-19 uh, impacts that the schools may be willing to share on this evening. So with that said, I'll step aside and uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, board members, uh, Dr. Casey, thanks for the opportunity for us to discuss with you some of the issues we have in the school division and um, in alignment with uh, James's presentation. <clears throat> a couple points to kind of consider. First of all, is kind of to set the, the setting for where we are with the school division. It's a different school year than last school year. Last school year, we had about 40% of our student population was in, in our buildings. We had concurrent teaching. This school year, we have 98% of our students in our building. We do have a virtual academy with almost 2,000 students. Um, but certainly we also have before us a law that requires us to be open. So we're trying to work within those parameters for this school year. One of the biggest pieces of the school division has been transparency, uh, and transparent with our families, with our staff about what's occurring with regard to COVID. One of the big things that we've done, and I'll walk through really quickly, is create a kind of a, a dashboard, if you will, for the school division. Uh, and it's on our website for families as well. It provides uh, the guidance piece, which is um, a big piece for our families to see kind of the pieces that are that are within uh, the school division, whether it's the VDH case information, the self-assessments we'll talk about in a second, um, regarding student support for absences, as well as obviously um, some other pieces there with regard to how we contact trace and when there's a positive case. One of the big pieces obviously we put forward and we've been a, a leader across the Commonwealth as far as school division with regard to kind of the communication of positive uh, tests. Uh, but one of, one of the things we really wanted to strive to do is really to give some perspective, if you will, to the cases we have in our school division. Certainly we don't take away from the impact it may have on an individual family if they have a child, certainly a staff member as well. But understand that we have almost 63,000 students and almost 10,000 employees overall working in our school division. We did wanna give some perspective about what's occurring in our school division. And you'll see that the percent of in-person uh, school population positive test, and obviously the positive cases over seven days. Obviously seven days um, is a, a key marker for all of us as we look at this. Further, you can see on here a breakdown for students and staff, as well as where within the, the cases are located, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school. We have included um, on our website uh, quarantine data. You're able to track closely by each school on a seven-day mark, as far as the number of students that have been quarantined across the school division. Um, as well, one of the big pieces that we have in the school division is that we notify staff and families of every COVID case. It's important to note that that's a little bit different than how the VDH does it in the sense that we report after we've conducted contact tracing. The point of the notification is to notify families, certainly if they've not been contacted by us, that they do not have to have a concern with regard to that COVID case. But we do wanna acknowledge that a COVID case did exist um, within that. So you'll see here, um, it's a scrolling marker there for all of our um, cases there that are designated by uh, student and staff as well. So that obviously is a key piece um, for us. <laughs> Big picture, the pieces that we continue to, to strive, as James said as well, the piece there is obviously two biggest pieces for the community is certainly our self-assessments, not just for staff, but for families, um, taking very seriously the requirements before they come onto school property. The second piece is encouraging where possible for student, uh, students and staff to be vaccinated. Certainly that's the, the key mark for us as well. When it comes to relationships, obviously the relationship we have with the, the county, uh, quite frankly, is very strong, especially with regard to risk management. Uh, Dave Johnson and Kyle Campbell especially have been strong partners for the school division, giving us uh, guidance and assistance throughout, certainly the VDH and uh, Dr. Samuel and his staff. Um, I've talked to Dr. Samuel uh, quite frequently as well as his staff. He's very accessible, um, very uh, clearly knowledgeable, helping us navigate through some difficult situations. You know, we do get a lot of questions with regard to the contact tracing piece. We have seen a little bit of relief when it comes to our school buses. As we began the school year, we had to contact trace within six feet for each case. To put that in perspective, um, if you had a student sitting in the back corner, which is ideal in the sense of contact tracing, um, if I had to contact trace that one case, I potentially could have to quarantine upwards of 10 students. If you think about a student sitting in the middle of the bus, if I had to contact trace a positive case, I could take out about 20 students by quarantine just looking at that. We did get some relief within that guidance. Uh, through the Department of Education, now that's back to three feet. Um, so clearly that's been a, an assistance with regard to the health perspective. We're constantly working through the sports related activities. Obviously the big piece for the school division and VDH is connected cases. Um, I mean, the VDH does use the term outbreak, 
Um, that word is a, a loaded word, quite frankly. An outbreak really is two or more connected cases. Um, we, uh, we do have on our website the connection, obviously, to BDH outbreak cases. It's important to note that there is a lag, quite frankly, in BDH reporting. Um, our reporting is much more timely and accurate, given the volume of cases that we have, clearly. Um, but clearly, what we want to do is connect with BDH with regard to sports-connected cases. We put in place just in the last couple of days, certainly when we have uh, two or more connected cases for sports, we are immediately pausing all sports activities for at least seven days. Is that, I'm sorry, is that indoor and outdoor, uh, Mr. Smith? Yes, because okay. you're looking at connected cases who have the ability to transmit further. Uh, the second piece, obviously, is the classroom piece. With that, the guidance we recently have put in place as of last week is that's for three or more connected cases. And so we're looking at, at those pieces, certainly from the school division, we we'll rely upon BDH when it comes to um, whether we have to quarantine an entire classroom and above. So that guidance comes directly from them if we need to do that. Currently, we've had since the beginning of the school year less than 10 classrooms that have quarantined entirely. It's important to note, obviously, having many more students in our facilities, the limited space, we're clearly trying to, to have the space and distance where possible. Masks clearly are required in our school facilities. But we also want to acknowledge certainly that our staff is working hard to maintain, whether it's a school bus or whether it's the cafeteria, maintaining seating charts that assist us throughout the contact tracing piece as well. The other piece is, um, obviously, we get a lot of questions regarding testing. Um, one of the things that the school division has done is we've expressed an interest to the Department of Education regarding a program they have, which is called VISTA, which will allow essentially uh, the way they've structured it, not by, by our, our guidance, but certainly they've structured it through pool testing. Um, that's a little bit different model. Certainly a pool testing has a lag to it, but that's what the Commonwealth is providing right now, potentially. We've expressed an interest in that. We're working through that process with them. They've just recently, in the last 48 hours, also um, provided school division some guidance with regard to potentially having some um, take-home tests. Um, we've expressed an interest in that as well. The, the Commonwealth has said that they will provide upwards of 5% of your student population for those at-home tests. We've expressed an interest in that as well. Um, I will note, even as we've worked closely with the Department of Education and BDH on those pieces, um, it's unlikely we will see those products in our hands by earliest late October, quite frankly. Um, kind of going forward, uh, James talked about the booster shot, certainly continually following the FDA guidance as far as that goes, as far as working closely with our, our staff. But quite frankly, two biggest pushes we're looking ahead is the flu shots, quite frankly. That's a big push that's going to happen within our school division mid-October. And the next piece is, um, this is a piece we look, look to kind of partner once again with the county with regard to some community-wide testing when the uh, shots do become available, vaccination shots for ages 5 to 11. I think that'll have a a very big impact on our community and clearly on our school division. I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, board members may have. Thank you. Any questions, board members? Or comments? When the 5 to 11 year old shots come out, are we going to um, use the nurses to do that? Or how have we had that discussion about how that's going to happen? We started that discussion. And quite frankly, I think one of the things anecdotally I would say is that I think it's going to be a major push for the county proper. I think uh, if we can look to work clearly together on that, but even looking to, to, to stand up the larger operational piece that we had with regard to the, the fairgrounds, Virginia State University, I, I think quite frankly we could see it at that level. 